Welcome back to another episode of The Road Chose Me and my last couple of videos about vehicles and why I choose to drive what I drive. They've caused a bit of controversy, there's been a ton of comments and everyone wants me to review certain vehicles or talk about why I drive what I do. So in this video, I'm gonna go over my top five criteria. When I'm walking around Overland Expo, when I'm at Jeep shows, there are some vehicles I look at and I just immediately write them off. If you're wondering why I do that and what my criteria are, stick around, I'll get into the top five right now. So for me, the number one thing that I look for in an Overland vehicle is that it absolutely has to fit inside of a 20 foot shipping container. For me, when I think about overlanding, I'm interested in exploring the world. I wanna see Mongolia, I wanna see Iceland, everything. That means I have to be able to ship my vehicle. And for me, I'm just an ordinary guy spending my savings account on this. I can't afford to spend tens of thousands of dollars shipping my vehicles around. So personally, for me, it has to fit. That's just a must. The door on a 20 footer is usually the limiting factor. Width wise, if it's legal on the road, it's probably going to fit inside of a container. So you have to look at the overall height of the vehicle. When I see these massive sprinter vans with a ton of stuff on the roof, or I see the big earth roamers that are just enormous, I pretty much immediately write them off. Not only can I not afford the vehicle, I can't afford to ship it overseas. So that just rules it out. As a rule of thumb, the door on a 20 foot container is about seven foot six high or 2.28 meters. Check out all the details in my shipping video. Failing that, you could put it inside a 40 foot high cube container. If you can't find someone to share with, that's gonna cost you twice as much, which is a bummer. But the door on those things is about eight foot five high, which is about 5.56 meters. So for me personally, any vehicle that's taller than that, I'm just gonna eliminate it right away. Not good enough for me to drive around the world. The second thing that I look for in a potential overland vehicle is what kind of mileage or fuel consumption does it get? There's a couple of different reasons why that's such a high priority. And the first one just comes down to budget. If your vehicle uses too much fuel, you're just gonna to spend too much money on your expedition, which makes the whole thing unworkable in the first place, and then you'll never even go on the trip. Secondly, if your vehicle burns a lot of fuel, you're just gonna to have to carry an enormous amount of it and that's gonna exceed your payload. You're gonna spend a ton of money on external tanks trying to carry it all, and everything again just becomes unworkable. And then third reason is there are countries around the world that have fuel shortages, and sometimes sourcing a small amount is possible, but the more you need, the harder it can be to find. So when I talk about consumption, what am I looking at as a number? Personally, my goal is 20 miles a gallon US or better than that somewhere around 11 and a half liters per hundred. So my first little Jeep I drove to Argentina, that thing was so light, it got between 19 and 20 miles a gallon every day for the whole expedition. That was great. It meant I'd never carried a jerry can just once. And it also meant that I didn't spend a fortune on gas. This Jeep obviously is much more outfitted with the pop-up roof, the bumpers, the winch, the water tank. It's a lot heavier. And if I drive it gently, which I like doing, and because it has the six speed transmission, I can actually get between 18 and 19 miles a gallon in this. So it's not quite reaching my target number, but it's pretty close. For me, that's what I'm aiming for. When I read online other vehicles out there that when they're fully kitted out for expeditions, they get somewhere around eight to 10 miles a gallon, which is around 30 liters per hundred, I just shake my head and say, there is no universe where I can drive that vehicle. I'm gonna spend such a huge amount on fuel that I'll just have to go to work for more years before I can even make the trip. And I don't even know logistically how I can carry that much fuel to be able to get the kind of range I want to explore wild places. I mean, yeah, there's always external tanks, there's always jerry cans and roto packs, but at some point you can have hundreds and hundreds of pounds of fuel on board which is hundreds of pounds of less gear you can bring and less enjoyment for your trip because you'll have less food and less comfort and less clothing. So for me, vehicle consumption is such a big factor 
and I'm not even gonna consider something that gets as bad as eight or 10 miles a gallon. The third thing that I look for in an overland vehicle is that the steering wheel has to be on the left, commonly called left-hand drive. And I know it's become really popular these days to import vehicles from Australia, from Japan, and those vehicles have the steering wheel on the right-hand side. And yep, if they're old enough, 25 years in the US, 15 years in Canada, you can legally import them, you can drive them here, and I know people want them because they're like unobtainium and you can get fun diesel engines and all those different things. But what a lot of people don't realize is there are countries in the world you cannot drive a right-hand drive vehicle through. So even as a tourist, even though you're just getting a temporary import permit, there are a couple of countries you physically will not get through and it destroys your entire trip and your entire route. And lots and lots of people in North America don't even know this applies to Central America. So for the last five or so years, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, and sometimes Panama, they will not let you drive a right-hand drive vehicle through their countries. So this means if you own a right-hand drive and you would like to drive the Pan American Highway, you simply cannot, it is impossible. What tons of people end up doing is they ship out of about Mexico and they go down to South America. So you're gonna skip four or five really amazing countries just because the steering wheel of your vehicle is on the wrong side. That's a really big negative in my book. The other one in the world that's really painful is Saudi Arabia. Again, you cannot drive a right-hand drive vehicle through there. And I know you're gonna say, well, that's okay because I don't wanna to go to Saudi Arabia anyway. Well, actually it turns out you might wanna go there because it's a really helpful country to get from Central Asia down through the Middle East into Africa or vice versa. So tons of my friends that were driving the length of East Africa when I was doing it, everyone comes up to Sudan and then there's a ferry from Sudan to Saudi Arabia, you transit Saudi Arabia and then you're into Oman, then you can get ferries to the rest of the world from there and it lets you continue on through Central Asia. You don't have to go through Egypt, which is a pain. You don't have to spend a ton of money shipping out of Egypt. So Saudi Arabia is like a real gateway that enables you to go more places. And again, if you have a right-hand drive, you simply can't take that route. As it stands right now in 2020, there is no country in the world that does not allow a left-hand drive to be temporarily driven through their country. So I know, I know, lots of people say, you can't register a left-hand drive in Namibia, you can't register a left-hand drive in Australia or wherever. And that's true, I agree with you, but as a tourist, simply passing through temporarily, you can drive a left-hand drive through those countries. So in that regard, for me, right-hand drive, completely off the table, not interested. Obviously, if I was staying in Australia, yeah, fly to Australia, buy a right-hand drive, stay in Australia, sell it again before I leave. Of course, that makes sense. But for a global platform that I wanna to go to many continents or many countries, right-hand drive is off the table. Steering wheel, it's gotta be on the left. The fourth criteria that I look for in an overland vehicle comes down to the modifications that have been added to it and how close to stock the vehicle is. So especially in the four wheel drive world, it's really common to put things like flat fenders on the front and have huge tires that stick out past the guards. And for me, those are just absolute no's for a vehicle that I'm gonna drive around the world. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is you're gonna get so much more attention from border guards, from police, even if they're not corrupt, they're gonna pay you more attention and more scrutiny because your vehicle stands out so much. But on top of that, the corrupt ones are gonna use it as a reason to try to get money out of you. So they're just gonna look at your flat fenders and they're gonna say, that's illegal, you have to give me $100. Whereas when you have stock fenders, nobody ever commented on mine even once in 100,000 miles through 55 countries. Further to that, things like tires that stick outside the guards, they are so highly illegal in many countries, like for example, Europe or Australia, you won't even be allowed to take your vehicle out of the shipping container if your tires stick outside the guards. They are so strict on that stuff, they'll put your vehicle off the road in the first two minutes. And in fact, I read a report 
of people who shipped a vehicle to Australia and actually shipped it back again before they even took it out of the container because customs wouldn't let them because it was way too wickedly modified. Same story goes for big stinger bumpers, things like LED tail lights that aren't the right colors, all those kinds of modifications that make your vehicle look like a monster truck or just take it away from the stock like safety features, those are just gonna be a headache when you try to go internationally. So those modifications to me, they rule out a vehicle for driving around the world. One, you're gonna get too much scrutiny and two, it's actually impossible in many parts of the world. Keep the vehicle closer to stock, you're gonna have a way better trip. And then finally, the last criteria I look for in a potential overland vehicle, it comes down to the real practical stuff. I'm interested in where am I gonna sleep? I'm interested in where am I gonna cook? And where am I gonna eat my food and hang out when it's pouring rain or when the mosquitoes are really, really bad? And so this stuff just comes down to practical and it comes down to how much are you gonna enjoy your trip? So having spoken to hundreds and hundreds of overlanders out there driving around the world, I can tell you once you've been on the road six months or especially after 12 months, these kinds of creature comforts, they really determine your trip. And they determine whether you're actually enjoying it and you wanna continue on and keep having these amazing adventures or whether you're really just tolerating it and you get to the point where you're sick of it and you say, I'm done with this sleeping in the mud business, I wanna go home. And I think this applies doubly if you have a spouse or a partner, because keeping everyone happy on the road is really important. And let's be honest, once you're on the road for six months or 12 months or more, it's not just a vacation, it's actually your life. You're actually making the choice to go and do this long, long term. So being comfortable is really important. I think it really defines your trip. And to be really honest with you, where you sleep, where you eat, and where you cook, that's gonna impact your trip a lot more than the badge that's on the front of your vehicle. And I know everyone wants my opinion on this Land Cruiser or this Land Rover or whatever vehicle, but to be honest, I'm gonna say that isn't as important as the three things that I just mentioned. So have a good look at the vehicle you're considering and start thinking about what are your sleeping options. I actually bought this Wrangler specifically to buy this pop-up roof because I knew for three years on the road, it would just make such an enormous difference to my life. And everything else you can work around, you can figure out solutions, but something like a really nice sleeping setup, that's gonna be hard to do on like say, a little two-door Suzuki Jimmy, because rooftop tent is gonna take up so much real estate, you're gonna have all that weight up high. So really think about those three things Think about them way more than what winch you're gonna run or what size tires you're gonna have because it really will shape your trip that much more. So there you have it. That's my top five criteria that I look for in a vehicle that I'm gonna build into something to go and explore the world. What did you think of my list? Kind of interesting, some of the things I left out, isn't it? Priorities are a lot different when you're gonna head off around the world. So let me know down in the comments, what's your top five criteria? What's a not on my list that you would include? How do you disagree with me? I'm interested to hear and learn from you guys. If you enjoyed the video, please do hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to my channel, plenty more videos coming. And I have to give a big shout out to my supporters on Patreon too. These guys are helping fund what I'm doing here, bring this content to you, and they're helping to keep the wheels turning as well. So. With any luck, there are new adventures coming. And so thanks heaps to those guys on Patreon that are making that happen. So until next time, guys, stay safe out there, keep having adventures, and I'll see you right here on The Road Chose Me.